Okay, I think we'll get going. So hello everyone, really nice to have so many of you join us. Um, uh, I can still see everyone coming in. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name's Rachel and I am the Research Communications Manager here at Blood Cancer UK. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. We had a lot of questions come in when people signed up. So thank you so much for your questions. Um, they were really insightful, really interesting. There were a lot. So what I've done is I've grouped them into the most common ones um, and I'm gonna be posing them to our lovely panelists tonight. Um, what I will say is try, if you can try not to ask questions specifically about your diagnosis because we can't answer specific questions like that um, try and keep them as broad as possible. Um, and you can still ask questions today during the session, just use the little Q&A um, button down below um, and I'll try and pick some questions from there as well. But as I say, we did have quite a lot come through previously. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a good session. Um, no question is a silly question. If you've got any worries, any anxieties, you want to find anything out, please, please just ask. We've got um, a great a great lineup tonight. Um, so we're joined by Sian, Sarabi and Alison. Alison is a psychotherapist at King's who specializes in hematology. Sian is a cancer immunologist um, and a consultant in Southampton. And Alison is uh, a doctor of infectious diseases in Manchester. Um, so we're joined by incredible um, brains and minds tonight and really delighted to have you all. So thank you so much. Um, um, I think that's it. I think that's all I need to say to get started. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about the vaccines, what's going on with research, what's going on with alternative treatments, and also some questions about, you know, how to deal with a world opening up when we still don't have conclusive answers for people with blood cancer. Um, so we're going to try and cover some of that. Um, and I think the first question is going to come to you, Sian, um, to give everyone a little bit of an update on the latest research and vaccine effectiveness. Um, okay, so um, how wide, uh, so I'll, I'll talk, kind of give overviews. Um, so latest research, so um, we know, for instance, um, so a lot of this data is probably drawn specifically across broad populations, healthy individuals, population studies, so not specifically to blood cancer patients. Uh, we know, for instance, that one vaccine is better than, um, sorry, uh, one vaccine is protective, but two vaccines, two doses is better. So the second dose is very important. We know that these vaccines are very effective at uh, preventing um, people from catching COVID. Um, and, um, and this applies really to the original, what we call the wild type variant, the first kind of virus that we encountered. Um, we have obviously since, I think everyone will have noticed that, you know, there, there are much many more variants since then. We know a lot of the data shows that they are also, they still continue to be very effective at, uh, as catch, uh, at preventing the transmission of the other variants. There is less da data on the current Delta variant that is currently spreading. So the vaccinations are really, really important, obviously. Uh, and the problem is, and that's why we're here really, is that the, we have less clarity for patients with blood cancers. Is that a good enough start, Rachel? I think it's a very good, a, a good start. And what I will say as well is we, on our website, we have lots of information um, about the research coming out in specific areas, what it means for specific types of blood cancer. Um, and you can read all of that. Um, on our website uh, and we will try and put um, a link in the chat. Um, Sian, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about antibody tests. So a lot of people uh, who have had their vaccines are wondering if they should get, a, get an antibody test to, to see if they've worked or not. So do you want to comment on kind of their utility, what they show and what they don't show? Yes, um, so antibody tests, um, it, it, it's fraught. <laughs> So th there's no quick answer. So, so it's so the antibody testing. So the, the vaccine um, is, as, as you say, designed to elicit antibodies. Um, that, that's one part of the immune system. The other part of the immune system, which I will talk about a bit further, is, is T cells. So um, we all the studies will in part use um, the antibodies as a measure. So we would expect 
after you have one dose of vaccine, antibodies against um, the virus should go up. And after the second dose, it should go up further. Um, and, but what it doesn't show obviously is other parts of the immune system. So like I said, T cells, that is only protection against COVID has the two elements, two main arms of the immune system, which is involved. One is your antibodies, which are produced by your uh, a special type of white cells called your B cells. And the other, the T cells are really, really important. So if you've had an antibody test um, and you have uh, anti, an anti, you, you do have detectable antibodies, then that's reassuring. If you don't have antibodies, then there's no need to panic in the sense that there, you may have um, a T cell response, which is protecting you as well. Now, the level of the antibodies that you have is there's less clarity about that. A lot of, you know, de depending on where you're getting tested, every hospital or rather a lot of hospitals are using different, um, different assays, different testing platforms. So it's hard to compare one level in one testing system versus the other. That's one thing to say. So how high a level you need to protect you from COVID, we don't know yet. That's a really good answer. And we've actually had another question come through about T cells, as you've just mentioned. And it says, can we get our individual T cell response assessed? Why not? Okay. So the, the T cell assay is, why not? It's, so it's not a it's not a standard assay that um, the NHS labs run, partly because it's incredibly involved. So just to compare and contrast, antibody measuring is literally what what it is you take some blood, we measure the level of antibodies. So it's a fairly straightforward assay. It's very robust. T cells, the T cell assay is literally we take blood from you. We have to purify the T cells or, or the, the live cells from your blood, we then have to stimulate these cells with the original um, or short proteins from the virus. And then we measure the level of response produced by the T cells. That's the only way we can uh, measure a T cell response. And as you can imagine, there's a big difference in how involved one assay is versus the other. And also in the T cell assay, you know, whether we took your blood immediately and ran the essay versus we took it, you know, 20 hours later, all these matters, how fresh the blood is, etc. So it's not a routine test, it is unlikely ever to be, it continues to be a research assay. There are companies who are trying to standardize it, but I can say that from experience, it's still really hard to comment on it. It's, it you, we can draw conclusions based on large groups of patients but it is possible that um, the level may very well change if I tested your blood and did T cell assay today versus if I did it again tomorrow. So that's why we don't do this routinely. There is a lot of um, variability for that reason. Yeah, definitely. And um, they're also very expensive, aren't they, um, to do at the moment. Um, but what we have done, so the research we funded as Blood Cancer UK, we will get some data on um, T cells in some in some people with blood cancer. Um, so watch this space, and we'll we'll kind of update you on it um, as we can. I've just seen someone has put in the chat. David's put in the chat. I had one, but it was told it would only pick up antibodies created by having had COVID, not from the vaccine. So I think, Sian, um, David's had one looking for natural infection as opposed to um, antibodies from the vaccine. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, so there are different domains. So all the vaccines, essentially, um, they incorporate the, um, the sequence of the spike protein. So how we, so how we differentiate, for instance, um, whether someone has a natural infection is by them detecting antibodies to nuclear protein, which is separate from the spike protein. So you've had a test towards a different area of virus, virus versus the spike protein, which is what is um, in, the, um, in the vaccine. Yes, yeah, so we have lots of different kind of antibodies circulating. We produce not just one antibody to, to um, 
COVID, we produce a number of different ones. And so one test will look at something called the N antibody, which is an antibody produced when you catch COVID. And another, the, the one that looks at um, whether you have antibodies produced by the vaccine is something called the S antibody. So you've got to make sure you're getting the right test. You've got to make sure if you are looking for antibodies to the vaccine, you're wanting a test where uh, you're looking for the S antibody. Um, and that can cause a lot of confusion. Um, I'm going to move away from vaccine research just for a minute to let some of our other lovely um, panellists come in. Um, and Sarabi, I've had a question in um, online saying, how do I make other people understand my anxieties around people considering my condition and for them to act responsib responsibly around me and respect me? Thanks, Rachel, and thank you for submitting that question. Um, I want to start by saying that unfortunately at several times during this pandemic uh, people who are vulnerable people who are blood cancer patients have may have felt at a broader societal level a bit left aside not considered and I think all of us who work in blood cancer or with people who have serious illnesses have felt I certainly have felt frustrated about that um, we all want to be understood by people we all want people to respect us that's a basic human desire um, unfortunately it's not in my control what somebody else understands or respects. What I can control is my choices, what I say to other people, and what I choose to do or not do. Um, I suspect that for most of us, um, we, have, we have relationships, social relationships, which are in different layers. So, you know, at the very first layer is people, is myself, and, you know, people really close to me, like close family members, close friends, people I'm very intimate with. With something like blood cancer, it might even be your professional clinical team who's looking after you, your nurses or your doctors. And then there might be people who are a bit more distant. There might be acquaintances, work colleagues, friends who are not that close, um, neighbors, people like that. Um, and at the very edges of the periphery are just complete strangers who you might encounter. Now, I share this because knowing this will influence, firstly, how important it is to us that somebody understands where we're coming from and also how much effort and time we are willing to put in order to make sure that any misunderstandings are actually resolved. Um, I said at the start that we can't control what somebody else thinks or does, but we can control and get better at practicing how to be assertive about our right to do what we need to do to stay safe without feeling ashamed or embarrassed about that. Um, we can, things that can get in the way of that assertiveness are if we've experienced sort of social traumas in the past, or if we've experienced a lot of rejection, people who suffer from low self-esteem or low self-confidence struggle to be assertive, or it might be that, you know, somebody with a blood cancer diagnosis might feel a little bit tired of feeling different from other people anyway. And this just adds another layer of difference on top of that. Um, and these emotions are all valid. And I just want to say that it's not embarrassing or stupid to feel upset when somebody doesn't understand you or makes a hurtful or insensitive remark. We're social beings and we would all feel like that. It's very, it's built into us to um, want to be understood by people around us, even if they don't actually matter that much in our day-to-day -day life. Um, so processing this can be helpful. Uh, it can be helpful to even speak to, a, speak to somebody like myself or, or uh, another professional to understand why do I react like this when somebody doesn't understand me? Um, but then what we want to do is to set boundaries clearly. And how you do this will vary depending on your relationship with the person who's not understood you or not respected you. Um, using phrases like, I'm just not comfortable doing that yet, or my doctors advised me that I probably shouldn't do that yet, um, or my immune system is compromised. So give a simple explanation for your choice in, you know, without apologizing for it. Um, if you face pressure or lack of understanding, and it, sadly, if it's coming from somebody very close to you, this can be really painful. What I might suggest then is to explain to the person how it makes you feel that they are not understanding. You know, it, I might use a phrase like, you know, it, 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 uh, it hurts me that you don't seem to be able to understand why this is important to me or why uh, this is where I'm at with this right now and that you're not able to accept that and support me with it. Um, if you're genuinely feeling bad that you're not able to go to an important event like a birthday or a, or a wedding, uh, you know, it's okay to acknowledge that and say, I would really want to be there. And, you know, let's try and do something afterwards to mark this occasion. Um, if it's somebody a bit more distant, uh, 
and maybe they're just unaware, then it might be sufficient to just say, actually, even though I've been vaccinated, we're not sure how effective the vaccine is. So I'm just being a little bit careful. And they might be, their lack of understanding, if, if, if that's the issue, then they should get it. And they're, they might be respectful of your choices after that. Then, of course, there are situations where your best choice is to politely walk away uh, rather than argue the validity of your point. And these are situations where, you know, it's not lack of understanding that's the issue, it's lack of respect. And unfortunately, what this pandemic has shown is that while there are a lot of people who are caring and considerate, there are a proportion of people who are not. And I think we are good at judging where it's gone from. Actually, I can explain it as much as I want to, but I don't think this person is going to understand. I think we have a radar for that. So when it's reached that point, you could say something like, I don't feel it's useful to argue about what's the right thing here. How about I do what's right for me and you do what's right for you? Um, sometimes that is the, is the most helpful option. Naturally, in a public place like a supermarket, we can't get into long conversations with strangers necessarily. So again, come back to what you can control, you know, um, your actions. So avoiding crowded aisles, maybe waiting for people to pass by before you approach a shelf, wearing a mask, even if it's not required to um, in the space you're visiting. Um, I, if I'm not wrong, Rachel, Blood Cancer UK has some is it badges that people can wear that that just subtly indicates that I'm still extremely vulnerable? Please, please keep your distance from me. Um, this is very similar to people wearing badges now on the tube or on buses saying I'm exempt from wearing a face covering because of a health condition, which can communicate to people. I want to end this point by reminding everyone also that the human mind is very good at focusing on the bit that's the problem that's not going right. So we can exaggerate the importance of the one person who makes an ins insensitive remark or doesn't understand and give it a lot more attention. Uh, instead of that, I think it's helpful to remember that for every one individual who doesn't understand or respect your vulnerabilities, there are many people who do. So my advice would be to focus on the people who do understand and uh, find, find who your community really is. And it might be that for some people, it's an online community of support like this with other blood cancer patients. But the mind can really fix on the one person who um, hurt you instead of focusing on all the people who are around you, supporting you and understanding that you need to go at your own pace. I think that's really, really, really good advice, Sarabi. And, you know, I, I take a lot from that as well as someone who doesn't have blood cancer. You know, we're all navigating for this this for the first time. And it's been it's been really difficult. Um, particularly if you have a partner who who doesn't have blood cancer, who's not immune compromised, who wants to get back to normal. It's really difficult and we're all navigating it. Um, and yes, absolutely. Kind of what, what strikes me is that blood cancer is not is not necessarily visible. You know, not everyone um, with blood cancer looks like they're ill. Uh, and that's really hard because, you know, if you if you don't look like you've got cancer, how how do people um know to kind of stand back and stay away and keep the distance uh, and as Sarabi says we do have badges um on our website that says that say please stand back I'm shielding um and they're free of charge if anyone would like to get one Jackie says if they can read the badge they are too close which is a very very important point um that's a very fair point yeah it's a, yeah it's a completely fair point um Jackie but it may help it may help for situations where somebody has stepped close sort of without realizing it you know I mean it, it might be that people genuinely once they know what they've done they they sort of are okay with that so yeah yeah and kind of we have thought of a charity as a charity what else we could do and we haven't come up with the right answer yet I we, we're not sure a t-shirt is <laughs> is the best idea um but Jackie if you have any ideas of what you would like what would help you what would what would make you feel comfortable and that goes for anyone on on this webinar this evening if you've got any idea of what would make you feel more comfortable let us know and we'll try and make something happen um so yeah please please let us know um Alison we haven't heard from you yet um so some of you are wondering why we've got an infectious disease <laughs> um uh doctor on the call and that's a, it's a good question. Uh, and that is because Alison was one of the researchers who was part of a trial called Provent. Um, and Provent uh, was, is a, is, was, is a clinical trial looking at whether we can prevent COVID, not through vaccination, but um, through an infusion of something called monoclonal antibodies. Um, and so these are kind of alternative ways we might be able to kind of protect people from COVID 
uh, who don't respond particularly well to the vaccine. Um, Alison, do you want to explain a little bit more about Proven, what it was, and kind of some other monoclonal antibody treatments that kind of might be in the pipeline? Yeah, sure. So, so as as Sian and Rachel have said, you know, um, the, the best response to, to protection is, is a vaccine because a vaccine teaches your immune system uh, if you meet the, vac the, the virus in the future to make antibodies. Um, but if you can't make antibodies, then what do you do? Well, you cut out the immune system and you, and you give antibodies and there's lots of interest in this field. Um, so firstly, I should say that the antibodies that have been made by various drug companies are being used in two different contexts. One is in the actual therapy for people who have got COVID and secondly as uh, prevention so like a vaccine trying to trying to uh, prevent somebody getting getting COVID if they encounter the virus in, in the future so um, AstraZeneca is only one of many drug companies that have made these monoclonal antibodies um, and there's there's three ongoing studies for AstraZeneca one is called storm chaser study and that was looking at using these monoclonal antibodies in post-exposure prophylaxis so um, this was looking at people who had been exposed to, uh, to COVID, um, household contact or a work contact within eight days, giving them either placebo or the monoclonal antibodies and then seeing if they want, went on to develop COVID. And Provent was looking at, um, sorry, that was post-exposure prophylaxis and Provent is looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you're giving individuals who are healthy, uh, you test them, we tested them at baseline to make sure that they weren't brewing uh, COVID. And then you give them either placebo or monoclonal antibodies, and then you follow them up over time and you see how many uh, cases of COVID are, are recorded. So um, AstraZeneca is just one company that's that's been involved in making these monoclonal antibodies. Um, probably the the, the other two companies that are perhaps further along in the development of their monoclonal antibodies are Eli Lilly um, and um, a company called Regeneron. You, you may have heard of Regeneron. The, anti, the monoclonal antibodies that Regeneron made were used in the recovery study. So let's come back to Provent, bring it back to Provent. So uh, we were a site uh, in, in Greater Manchester. I was the principal investigator for Provent. It's ongoing. And we recruited over 90 patients in, into the study. And what was nice about Provent, and uh, I've worked on the vaccine studies, is that all the people that were excluded from vaccine studies, people that had problems with their immune system, were welcomed into Provent study. So we have people in Provent who have blood cancers, who had renal disease, who have you know all, all the other uh, conditions that make you less likely to have a good response to a vaccine. And so we've just been following people up, recording you know. Uh, anybody with symptoms of COVID get seen, get swabbed, and then all that data is, is being analysed. So um, at the moment, they, they, AstraZeneca are analysing the data. Um, hopefully, I can't promise anything, but it, it seems likely that we might have some preliminary data by end of August, perhaps the beginning of um, September, to, to tell us whether or not these monoclonal antibodies are effective in preventing COVID. And also I should say that of all the different monoclonal antibodies that the uh, different drug companies are, are, are looking into, um, AstraZeneca's are long acting, you know, that, that's what makes them suitable for prevention. If you look at the um, normal antibodies, they hang around for you know two months, three months at the very most. But these antibodies have been engineered to last for six months or more. Uh, and in fact, that's part of what the study is looking at is to see exactly how long they last. They could last up for a year. So that 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 is would be fantastic to provide protection to somebody for that length of time. Um, so we're still waiting for for the results from Provent, but if I am I allowed to say a little bit about Storm Chaser, Rachel, is that okay? Yeah. So so Storm Chaser, as I said, is the um, the post exposure prophylaxis study. So we have got interim data from Storm Chaser. Um, AstraZeneca published this. Um, in the form of a news bulletin, which uh, we know is how we, we learn about effectiveness of vaccines now. It comes as a news bulletin rather than being published first in, in a journal. But anyway, that's that's life during during COVID. Um, so they published, um, a, they, they put out a news bulletin back in June. So the, the, the primary question that was trying to be answered in Storm Chaser is, do these monoclonal antibodies prevent you developing symptomatic COVID if you've been exposed. And unfortunately, that 
question was no, that it didn't reach statistical significance um, uh, for, for, for that. So it, in a sense, uh, AstraZeneca said it didn't meet the primary outcome. However, looking at the data that's been collected on participants in Storm Chaser, if you move away from that first couple of weeks, so you've been exposed to COVID, you know, you've had either the monoclonals or the placebo. If, if you're going to get COVID, it's going to happen in the first couple of weeks. So if you move onwards and these, and these individuals in the study are being followed up for a, a 15 months, right, and then look at the cases of COVID between the two groups, the placebo group and the group that got the monoclonal antibodies, it's very encouraging data to, to, uh, that suggests that these antibodies are functioning uh, as, uh, you know, as, as protection, okay? That's not what Storm Chaser was designed to look into. That's why you can't read too much into it. You can't extrapolate it, but it's certainly encouraging that ProVent is gonna, is gonna have good results. Thank you, that's really helpful. And, and obviously we'll keep our fingers crossed that ProVent has good results. Um, and for everyone listening, uh, we will of course stay really close to Alison and we will share results from ProVent as soon as we know. Um, what I will also say is that it's very high on our agenda um, to raise with the government um, that if these are shown to be successful that you know we know that some people with blood cancer don't respond to the vaccines as well and they should be prioritized so I want to reassure you that it's on our agenda um, and we will be doing everything we possibly can um, to make sure people get them. Alison. I just wanted to make, make the point that they're also very well tolerated you know, the, the, there was no difference in adverse uh, uh, events between the placebo group and the group that got the monoclonal. So these are really well tolerated. The drawback is they're given by an injection. Yeah, um, can't get around that for the moment, um, but it's, it's a one-off injection. And uh, certainly all, all the, the participants in, in, uh, for our study in Manchester, no, nobody had any problems with the injection. So, um, but very well tolerated, which is, is really good news. Amazing. That's what we like to see. Protection with no side effects. Um, that would be brilliant. So yeah, please keep keep a watch of all of our news and it'll be on last, all our social media channels and we will keep you up to date it, uh, updated and fingers crossed um, that we get some positive results. Um, Sian, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to ask you to delve a little bit more into the research and ask um, whether there's any groups of people with blood cancer um, that we're kind of more confident that the vaccines work for. Okay, so um, so I'm going to kind of refer to Prosecco study. So Prosecco is a study uh, that's led by Southampton. So what we did here is an observational study. So what we did was we uh, well, what, what's the study still ongoing? We, we take blood from patients before and after their vaccine, their first and second doses, and we're still continuing to do so. And in this study, we focus on patients with uh, lymphoma, and that included CLL as well. And um, so the numbers are still small, uh, but there's a trend across Prosecco and other similar studies. There's quite a few people have now re reported their data and th th these are all largely antibody data so we haven't had a chance to look at the T cells yet although that is that is coming soon so the general trends are um, if for if I can discuss about lymphoma first if we in our study we noted that patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma if you were um, if your disease has been treated and if you were vaccinated um, after your treatment condition, uh, after your, your treatment completed, and by after, I mean our data said six months, then, then we, we saw patients with very, very good um, antibody responses. This also applied to patients with um, high-grade B-cell lymphomas. So essentially, the patients where we could treat the disease, the disease goes into remission, then the patients receive their vaccination, after the effects of the treatment have worn out, then we suspect those groups of patients will have good antibody responses. Um, for everyone else, it's a bit of uh, an unknown entity. So in patients with um, what we classically describe as indolent lymphoma, um, so follicular lymphoma, um, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, um, there is less of a relationship. So chances are, if you are on treatment, then you're probably not, and you were vaccinated during this time, you're probably not going to mount a good antibody response. But 
even if you're off treatment or you've never been treated, we're still seeing in select cases where the patients do not develop an antibody response. And we don't quite understand why just yet. Um, outside of lymphoma, um, the so I'm kind of going across all the studies I've read and everything has to be taken with a bit of pinch of salt because a lot of studies are um, very, the numbers are still small. So, you know, while someone might advertise 500 patients whatsoever, when you break it down, how many patients have a specific diagnosis? Do they have it during treatment or after treatment? Those numbers are still relatively small. Um, Blood Cancer UK has an excellent initiative where they're trying to pool as much data as possible across the studies and that's what we really need. But in the meantime, it seems, for instance, like patients with um, chronic myeloid leukemia CML seem to respond pretty well, um, even if they're on imatinib. The numbers are small, but encouraging myeloma um, is generally okay. Depends again in relationship to whether they have treatment. CD, the CD, there are tumor map, the CD38 antibody, which is uh, often used in myeloma. Um, in some studies, they've shown that it may. Uh, dampen the responses in others they haven't. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Sian. That's really helpful. Um, and I kind of know how frustrating it must be for everyone to not have a definitive answer. Um, and I completely, I completely understand that. And we, you know, we are doing the research, we are funding it, and and we are hoping to get more data. And of course, we'll keep you updated on on that data. So, Rabia, I, I I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that frustration and and how to deal with that and and kind of settle your mind when you're so desperately want answers, but but we don't have them yet. Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so again, as human beings, there's there's two things that apply to all of us, whether you have blood cancer or not. And one is that we all have an anxiety and threat-based system that gets activated and is on high alert when we're faced with any kind of threat or danger. Um, and the second is we don't like uncertainty and we've had to live with both uh, for a long, long time, much longer than um, any of us could have imagined before the pandemic hit. And bear in mind, this uncertainty is on top of the uncertainty and anxieties that anyone affected by blood cancer has to live with day to day anyway, even before the pandemic um, hit. Uh, what this combination of fear and uncertainty does is it tends to uh, narrow our focus and make us think in uh, black and white rather than in a nuanced way. So we can start to think that, you know, until we have absolute certainty, we have to be completely on pause. So it, it's a very black or white way of thinking. And I wonder whether it can be helpful to introduce a little bit of nuance to balance this out a little bit. So for example, instead of saying there's no clarity yet and I have to avoid everyone and miss out on life all the time, I wonder whether it can be helpful to say, okay, there's not, I, I don't have a guarantee and I should still continue to avoid certain people in certain situations, but what are the situations in which I can um, expand my comfort zone a little bit, you know? Um, I think thinking about things that reduce the risk rather than aiming for certainty on what is absolutely safe can be helpful. Uh, just some ideas off the top of my head are um, meeting people who have been vaccinated, uh, meeting people who um, are willing to take maybe a rapid uh, lateral flow test before they, they, they come out and meet you, uh, meeting people outdoors, obviously avoiding large crowds and avoiding places with very little ventilation. Um, these are all things that can help reduce your sense of risk when you are starting to go out and about again. Um, the other really um, striking thing about this pandemic is that we got used to making decisions based on what others said we could or couldn't do. And this was heightened for people who were clinically extremely vulnerable and put into this category very explicitly of people who, are, who should be shielding and with very strict instructions on what they should or shouldn't do. And when we are living through an unprecedented time like that, where other people are telling us what, what's safe and what isn't, we can lose touch with that uh, internal cost benefit analysis that we all constantly have to do when we're weighing things up to make decisions for ourselves. So even before the pandemic, uh, people affected by blood cancers or people in their wider support network probably took decisions what, on what was safe or comfortable based on their clinical situation. So for example, 
if you've had a stem cell transplant, then not getting on a busy cra crowded bus or a tube, if you could help it, or avoiding people who had been sick with a cold. Um, and and um, so in some sense, this individual decision-making of risk has always been present, but it's been forgotten in this time of heightened threats and, uh, and, and strict rules that we've all been expected to follow. And I'm wondering whether perhaps now is the time to start to bring this equation back a little bit. I noticed a comment in the chat from somebody as well that they've started going out a bit more because they were fed up of uh, staying isolated. And um, everyone is different and will base their decisions on their individual cost benefit analysis. Um, for each of you, this will look slightly different based on how much you feel that missing out on so-called normal life um, is something that you're completely fed up of or something that you feel like on balance you're okay to do for a little bit longer. And there's absolutely no right or wrong answer when it comes to this. Um, it's quite likely that, especially based on what I'm hearing from Alison and Sian, uh, is that it's quite likely that the, the blood cancer community will have to live with uncertainty for a time to come yet. And so my advice would be to take decisions based on some of the things that have been said in this talk, try to problem solve and think about reducing the risk rather than, and, and appreciating that there'll always be an element of not knowing, that it's quite natural and healthy to feel a little bit anxious when you start to do something again that you haven't done for a long time. That's completely natural. Uh, you know, I've had patients who have been supporting tell me that they were very anxious when they first went and sat outdoors in a, in a cafe, but actually the more they did it, the, the, it became all right. And now it's within their expanded comfort zone area. So I'd like to think about this as gradually expanding your comfort zone. If you're reaching that limit of frustration and want to go out there and start to live a little bit. Um, I can't emphasize this enough that your exact clinical situation is a very important part of this, because what the calculated risks are that you're prepared to take will depend on your unique medical position at any given time. Uh, sometimes it might not feel like it's worth the risk if you're, I don't know, one week before coming into hospital for uh, some high dose chemotherapy or something like that, and uh, or treatment you've been waiting for for a long time. And in other situations, you might feel like, okay, after discussing with my team, I feel like this is this is a calculated risk I'm prepared to take. But there is no scenario in which stepping into something, re-stepping into something familiar or stepping into un something unfamiliar is going to be without anxiety. But anxiety is not an unhealthy emotion. Um, if it's important to you and if you've done your little risk, uh, risk assessment um, in consultation with your team, then um, it's okay to take small steps forward um, and feel anxious while you're doing that because it's only in the doing of it that your anxiety will settle down a bit. Um, and with the frustration, completely valid emotion, if for any reason you're feeling like it's not the time for you to step out there, know that there are people who share that frustration and, and empathize with you, and that it's a completely valid thing to feel. I think that's really, really great uh, advice, Rabi. Um... Thank you very, very much. Um, we can take lots from what you just said. So thank you. Um, I can see lots of comments coming through about kind of specific research in specific disease areas, like something on CLL. So kind of just to give you a quick overview, there was quite a big study in the University of Birmingham um, uh, who looked at, which looked at patients, about 300 patients with CLL, which found 75% had antibodies after the second vaccine. What I will say, though, is this depends, again, on treatment stage, whether you're on treatment, off treatment, whether you're on watch and wait, whether you, you've relapsed. So if I, you know, anyone on this call, please, please go and look at our health information pages, because that breaks everything down by disease type and treatment type. Um, so you'll be able to find um, the best information for you, your, your, your disease and your treatment stage um, on our website. And the link should be in the chat. I put it in there. Um, so please go and have a look at that. Alison, I think there is someone in the chat who had COVID um, around February and they want to understand a little bit more about kind of how long antibodies uh, that are created from natural infection, how long will they last? Um, I think it's very variable. It's difficult to just give a one size fits all answer. I mean, uh, you know, from, from articles and studies I've looked at, range antibodies are thought to, to, to range uh, from anywhere from two to nine months, you know, so it's very difficult to say for, for an individual. 
um, you know, the, the, this ongoing study such as the SIREN study, which is looking at healthcare workers, yeah, that's going to give us very good information about how long antibodies last. Again, that's that's in a specific population of healthcare workers. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to be vague, you know, not answer your question, but I think it's very difficult to say for an individual how, how long it, uh, your antibodies will last. Certainly they should, they should be lasting for, you know, for several months, you know, six, nine months or more, but it's difficult to, you know, to, to say. Um, and as, as you know, Sian said right at the beginning, it's not all about your antibodies, it's, it's obviously all about your T-cell responses and, and, and we, we don't have a, have a way of, of measuring that. Um, I, I, I think though that, um, trying to think which, which study I looked at it, certainly your antibody responses, I think following the vaccine um, are better if you've had natural infection. I think I'm right in saying that. Shian, Shian is that correct? That, that's absolutely correct, yes, yes. Um, um, and I think that's really encouraging, I, absolutely. And, and I think also probably because if you think about it, you've, you've had the exposure to the actual virus, so the breadth of your antibodies yeah. is, is probably wider as well. Yeah, and you took the words out of my mouth, Alison. I was about to say, um, people who have a vaccine after they've been um, infected tend to have a higher level of antibodies. So clearly on the same wavelength. Um, so we have just under 20 minutes left and I'm really keen to kind of cover what happens next. You know, pretty much everyone with blood cancer would have been offered two, two vaccines. What happens now? Do, do we get boosters? Do we get other treatments? Um, Sian, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about boosters and what your plans are for people with blood cancer. So, uh, yes, so there is a um, study called the Octave Duo study um, which is uh, uh, which is essentially a vaccine booster. So, so in this study, we are looking to recruit over a thousand patients um, uh, across the UK with um, various reasons um, of uh, whereby which they're immunocompromised. So, as part of this cohort, there'll be a group of blood cancer patients. Um, we have uh, focused on patients with lymphomas specifically because these tend to be the group of patients where we have seen um, the most impaired antibody responses. And I want to kind of probably quick, quick kind of reply to Dick Morris on the chat as well. So people with MP, MPNs, the myeloid disorders, seem to be all right in the sense we see generally high response rates. Again, it, it depends whether you get treatment, etc. cetera. And, um, but again, still small numbers, so needs kind of validating. Sorry, deviated there. So, so in this Octave Duo study, uh, we are looking to recruit some 300 odd patients with lymphomas. Um, they will have had at least two doses of um, they will have at least two doses of vaccine, and we're going to test the antibody levels. If they have no antibodies, or what we have arbitrarily, I have to say, selected as low antibody levels, then um, it, they will be randomised to um, three vaccines and the ones that we're actually testing are um, the two uh, the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine and another protein vaccine called Novavax. This is one of the approaches um, and, and so the, the aim of this study really is to guide the government as, about their boost, booster program in September. So it's really moving really fast. Um, if some of my patients, patients are on a call it may be that I've spoken to you in the last 24 hours and I will be speaking to you again. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the things we're doing. It's, there is already some early data about booster vaccines. So a couple of uh, groups have already published really small numbers. There's one case of one patient with lymphoma getting a booster vaccine after having no, treat, uh, no uh, response after two. There's another cohort of studies in uh, transplant, renal transplant patients, I think. I can't remember quite at the top of my head, but essentially we are seeing that that there, there is a chance of changing. If you don't have antibodies, there is a possibility that we can induce a response by giving a third vaccine. The questions remain are uh, whether this should be a different vaccine, obviously, but I also think it will come down to the nitty gritty question of why don't you have a response in the first place? If it's purely because you don't have response because you were vaccinated whilst you're in treatment, that's straightforward. That's something that we can rectify with further vaccines. 
if there is something inherently because you have a cancer of the immune system and your immune system is just not good enough to you know mount an immune re an antibody response then this is where provent comes in um, and where our understanding of T the importance of the T cells is, is really required. That's really helpful. And what I will say to everyone in the call is that um, Sian has literally moved mountains to try and get a trial funded, um, uh, a booster trial funded for, for people with blood cancer. And she's done a lot of work. So big thank you to you, Sian, um, because without you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have answers. And um, hopefully that trial will inform then the booster program in the autumn. And what I do want to read to you just quickly is um, the kind of interim advice uh, issued by the JCVI, which is the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation. And they've issued some kind of interim advice uh, on what will happen to the booster programme in autumn. And they've said the following person should be offered a third dose COVID-19 booster vaccine and the annual flu vaccine as soon as possible from September 2021. And that includes adults aged 16 years and over who are considered clinically extremely vulnerable first and foremost. So people with blood cancer will be in group one, they will be prioritized for the vaccine. And then in group two, it includes adult household contacts of immune suppressed individuals. So if you live with anyone aged 16 uh, or over, um, they can also be prioritized of back the vaccine, uh, the booster vaccine, and that's to protect kind of you uh, and make sure there are people protected around you. Um, so yeah that, that's the advice at the moment so we'll keep you updated with that as and when as and when we get more information um i quickly wanted to share with you a study that i read um and i found really interesting so it was a study that looked at uh, a mouse model which had blood cancer and it looked at um the way uh the way it was able to clear covid infection um, and interestingly, it found that in mice with no antibodies, T cells were really, really important um, uh, at fighting COVID infection. Now, it was kind of the opposite way around for um, when mice had been vaccinated and then um, infected with, with, uh, with COVID. In that situation, antibodies seemed to be really, really important and T cells kind of took a back seat. But kind of we know from that study that you know, if they need to, T cells do are seen to do something, and they do look to be important. Um, so that was some kind of really early, re really early data, and obviously it's not in humans, um, but hopefully that reassures people a little bit um, who kind of had had tests and show they have no antibodies. That you know that we we do have additional uh, you know defenses, and uh, you know for someone like me, um, I'm 25. I'm a healthy individual. For me, maybe my antibodies will be uh, enough to fight COVID um, and my T cells can kind of just chill and take a back seat. But for someone else where the antibodies don't work, maybe in, in these people, the T cells really, you know, come to life and, and protect them. And, and that's what we think might be happening, but it's it's really complicated, it's really confusing um, and, and we need to find data, but, but we are trying to find some data. Um, and Blood Cancer UK and the Blood Cancer UK Vaccine Collaborative, which includes um, Anthony Nolan, the British Society for Haematology and Myeloma UK. Um, so far, we've funded about a million pounds worth of research into this. Um, so we're really, really keen to find answers um, and we will definitely keep, keep trying. Um, I want to talk quickly about variants because we're hearing a lot in, in the news about Delta variants, the Alpha variant, the Beta variant, the wild type variant, it's all getting very scientific and very confusing. Um, and I had a question come through about, uh, about the variants and how concerned we should be about the Delta variant in particular. Um, Sian or Alison, do you have any thoughts, thoughts on this? I think variants, it, it's just, um natural evolution of the virus, when you put it under pressure with, with, with vaccines, we're gonna to have to live with variants. So we've got to get used to that. Um, certainly it's very clear that with the Delta variant, having two doses of the vaccine was, was incredibly important. Um, but as, as a physician, I, I will say that um, I had not got blase, that's the wrong word, but certainly I'd got a little bit more used to the situation with, with COVID and, and seeing people you know, being admitted. But when the Delta variant hit in the Northwest around Manchester and people were coming in very, very sick who'd had two doses of the vaccine, that really got me uh, very worried again. So I think we have to take it seriously. 
Um, if I can, can just uh, talk about the monoclonal antibodies, I, I know um, because of being involved with Provent, um, they showed us some very nice in vitro data uh, earlier on in the year showing that the monoclonal antibodies, that the AstraZeneca ones were uh, still effective against, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the geographical names because I can't remember all the numbers, but they were effective against the Kent variant, the Brazil variant, the South African variant. Um, and we're still waiting though to find out about um, the effectiveness against the Delta variant. Um, but yeah, we have, you know, we have to take this seriously, but it's something we're going to have to live with, you know, variants, are, they're not going away. I think I, I absolutely agree. Um, so I think the concern about the Delta variant is that we know it can, um, it's more transmissible. That's one of the things. Um, uh, so, and, but Asin's absolutely right. So we do know that in, in a, certainly in a test tube, um, when when we kind of the, the vaccines uh, the antibodies produced by the current vaccines do have some activity um, so it's just recently that the papers were, were published um, about uh, included also delta variant so it's not as effective against the original virus but it still has some some um, efficacy so we need those two vaccines they are not going to be as good as what they were but there is definitely still a, a massive benefit um, in that respect thank you um there's a couple of questions just sort of follow-up questions from octave duo uh somewhat and saying are you going to look um at the effect of having the flu jab and the booster jab together and that is novavax isn't it Sian? Uh, you you got me there. Uh, no, I don't think so. So the 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 Novavax is literally just a, 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 a the, the protein vaccine, whereas obviously the other two are mRNA vaccines. I don't think it's got a new vaccine, and I'm I could be no. embarrassingly caught out. No, it def definitely doesn't have have new vaccine with it. But um, I mean, it would it would make perfect sense moving you know forwards to have a co-formulated you know vaccine. Like kids have vac kids get a dose with uh, Hexavax, isn't it? They're, they're protected against six different uh, conditions. So it would make sense to have a, 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 a formulation of both the vaccine against flu and against COVID. But um, I don't think there's a, there's a formulation involving the two together, but there's certain, certainly studies ongoing looking at giving flu vaccine and COVID vaccine at the same time, because that would, you know, logistically, that that would that would make it a lot easier to deliver the, the booster and the flu vaccine, wouldn't it? Because it's the, the the booster for COVID is is you know, should be starting in September. That's when all the flu clinics are you know, get up and running. So it would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? But I'm not aware of of um, certainly Novavax is not. It doesn't got any any flu vaccine in it. Uh, but what is actually I was going to optimistically say it's quite interesting that we do know there's some cross reactivity between antibodies so like the actual coronaviruses people have detected antibodies in, in people that who even before the pandemic that, that appears that there is some cross reactivity with SARS-CoV-2 and maybe that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen that much flu it might be masking too obviously but because of the vaccination. I mean that would be good wouldn't it um, and someone has asked uh, what about flu this year? You know, are we, is it going to hit us harder? What's going to happen? Um, and, you know, just to say again, the JCVI guidance is saying that, you know, everyone with blood cancer should be prioritised for not only the COVID vaccine, but the flu vaccine as well. They'll be really, really important. Um, so please, please do get vaccinated. Uh, get, get, get your booster when you're invited. Um, so, Arby, I kind of want to finish with you. Um, and your advice on how we how we deal with this ongoing pa pandemic so Kay has asked how many years do you think this pandemic will last someone else has asked you know is this something we're just going to have to end up living with are we going to be have to are we going to have to do risk assessments every day for the rest of our life how, how do we deal with it and you know how do we deal with the unknowns in terms of not knowing how long it's going to last and not knowing what what our lives are going to be like in a year or two years time um I wonder if you can give us some advice on that I can try I mean all the ex experts who know about this much more than I do seem to say that it's going to be something we are going to have to live with whether we have to do the same level of risk assessment and every day I don't know I'm hopeful that that will change but I think a small level of risk assessment is something we would do anyway. 
um, especially if we're vulnerable because of a condition like blood cancer, or if we live with somebody who's vulnerable because of blood cancer. Uh, so thinking about this as similar to that can be helpful, although I appreciate the specific threat is different, but the way our mind deals with it can be similar. And we, we know this from other anxieties. I mean, the other thing to remember is I'm very hopeful listening to this conversation. I've learned so much from listening to Sian and Alison. Um, you know, a year ago, we didn't, nobody thought that there would be multiple vaccines available within a year of this pandemic, uh, of us knowing about this pandemic and this specific threat. And there's a lot of hopefulness that even with regards to the uncertainty about the vaccine efficacy, it sounds like actually, maybe we can't say how soon, but there will be data available based on research with blood cancer patients. So there is hopefulness in that, that a lot of the things that are unclear now will become clear at some point. We don't know what that time point is, but there is hope that it will become clearer. Um, until then, I think, I think actually, yes, we will have to carry on making small risk assessments, but that will change as well based on your medical situation changing. So a year from now, if you are no longer having treatment, if your cancer is in remission, then your clinical team might say that your risk, your risk profile will, might look different based on compared to where you might be now in your illness trajectory as well. So there will be things that will change. Uh, we won't, I don't think we'll have to carry on doing this for the rest of our lives, but some version of risk assessing will probably have to carry on for an indefinite length of time. But remember that we are, we are quite good at doing that as human beings. And I think Unfortunately, living under so many, so much data being thrown at us, so much information and so much instruction being thrown at us, we've probably lost contact with that, 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 that kind of our own rational ability to reason with facts and come to a conclusion of what feels right for me, rather than what should I do? I hope that's helpful. I mean, it is, it is, it's really helpful. And I think it applies to, to not, not only people with blood cancer, but everyone. Um, it, and it's really important advice. Uh, just, and I guess we've just got to take every day as it comes. Um, and sorry, sorry to interject, Rachel, but I feel like that could be one positive about having lived through this time, if there is one that um, we've been forced to live kind of day to day and with a changing picture of even with the rules, changing we've been forced to kind of live a little bit more uh short to medium goals rather than long-term goals yeah definitely and and you know if anyone ever is looking to have a chat to to kind of talk things through with someone we have a fantastic support line um, at blood cancer uk and you can call them for free on 0808 2080 um, and we also have an online forum that you can join and, and talk to other people and uh you can email um our support services team as well so please please kind of do get in, in touch with us anytime you need we're here for you and you know as i said tonight no question is a silly question we're all navigating this for the first time and and, you know we're all struggling so please do get in contact whenever you need um so it's one minute to seven so i am gonna wrap things up thank you so so much for all your questions i am really sorry we haven't managed to get to all of them because they're all really insightful and really really valid questions i hope the ones we did cover were helpful and kind of answered broadly um some more questions that you've had um what we'll what we'll do is uh, this session's being recorded so we'll put it um on all our social media platforms so you can re-watch it um and as i say if you do have any questions please get in contact with the support services team or any concerns um just want to finish by saying a big thank you to Alison, Sarabi and Sian for giving up their uh, Monday evening to be with us really really appreciate it um you're all fantastic um getting a lot of love in the chat um so yes thank you so much for joining us and also a big thank you to my colleague Kat um who is in the background hiding um who's done a lot of the, a lot of the work to set this up um she's been absolutely fantastic so thank you Kat as well um and thank you all for joining it's been really really lovely to have so many of you um and you know if you have any other ideas of what you want from Facebook lives in the future or any anything else you want us to cover please do let us know and we will be sure to do it um so with that thank you very much and see you very soon thanks Rachel thanks everyone thanks